Have you ever asked yourself this question? If you could have dinner with somebody, dead or alive, who would you have dinner with? You know, if you could pick any person at all, whether, you know, historical figure, uh, sporting champion, a world leader, you know, in the past or right now, like, who, who are the three, who are three people that you would pick to have, to have dinner with? You know, like, actually, why don't you just turn to the person next to you right now just, and just maybe go, oh, maybe this person, you know? So have a little think about that. Who are some of the people that you would ask? Some of the people you ask. You got a few ideas there? It'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? It'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Well, I would have you know that I asked this very question of some of our staff. And so uh, I asked out the staff here and I said, look, you know, who, if you could pick any three people, you know, past or present, you know, like who, who are the people that you would pick to have for dinner? And so we're going to, I've actually got the answers. Would you like to see the answers of who they said? I feel so Grant Denya family feud right now. The survey says, there it is. All right, so that's, that's some of the people now. Now, who are you look, now, I know what you're doing right now. You're looking at them. You're trying to match up who, who picked who, right? You're trying to match it up, all right? So, so I'm going to save you the trouble. We got, we're going to go through a little bit. Just, and you can, this can be a little bit interactive for the moment, all right? So you can call out your answers. So let's see. So, so just so you know, the people that I asked was uh, Pastor Joe, Pastor Mark, Pastor Nina, Pastor Neil, Pastor Julie, Pastor David, Pastor Nikki, and Jacinta. All right, so uh, Pastor Jacinta, we'll, we'll give her one as well. That's fine. <laughs> so who do you reckon out of all those people, this is like reverse family feud. It's like you've got the answers first, now you've got to match it to the category as opposed to the other way around. So who, who, do, you reckon, who do you reckon would have selected Mother Teresa out of those people? Any ideas? Yeah. Pastor Nina, Julie? Anyone else? No, it wasn't Jacinta. It was Nikki. Where's Nikki? Is Nikki here? Oh, better find out about that. Did you let you know? And then we had John G. Lake. Who was John G. Lake? It wasn't you, David, was it? It was you? I can't remember. I should have written the answers down. David was John G. Lake. Who picked Moses. Obviously, this is Moses from the Bible. Who picked Moses? Who do you reckon would have picked Moses? Anyone at all? It was just, yes, was it Jacinta? I can't remember. Who picked Moses? Maybe that was Nikki again. I think it was Nikki. Donald Trump. Who would like to have a meal with Donald Trump? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Who selected Donald Trump? Who do you think? Joe, of course, Joe. Of course, Joe. All right, Carl Lentz. Someone picked Carl Lentz. Was that you, Jacinta? No, it wasn't. That was Neil. That was Neil. That was Neil. Now, we had two people uh, choose their dads. And so, uh, no, it wasn't Jacinta. She can do that anytime she wants. Why would she do that? Was it One person was Neil. That's right, Neil said his dad. And then Nina said Pastor Mark's dad. You know, it's interesting that no one in any of these things ever picked, <laughs> that, that no one in any of it, like, they never picked, like, their partners or anything like that, you know, so, so Billy Graham, we had a Billy Graham, who was that? Who was that? That might have been Nikki again. Who was that, Joe, was that you? No, I think it was Nikki, we'll just give them all to Nikki. <laughs> Paul the Apostle, Pastor Mark was Paul the Apostle, and it was also... Jacinta, yes. We had Daniel from the Bible, that was you, David, yes. Roger Federer gets two looks. So Roger Federer and Jesus are kind of like the same according to this survey. You know, so, you know, so Roger Federer, who picked Roger Federer? Put your hand up. Mark and David. And then they went, Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's an interesting choice. That was Joe. Joe picked that one. Uh, I think Julie selected her grandmother, her gran. Billy Connolly. Now, who do you think would choose that? Not me. No, 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 no. None of these are me. Who do you think would choose that? It wasn't Neil. It was Julie. So I have concluded that she's got a thing for Scottish accents. That's the conclusion that I came to. Because I hope it's not the jokes. Because 
That would be a worry. Catherine Coleman. Nina. That was Nina. Right, C.S. Lewis. Pastor Mark, correct. Joshua. Steven Spielberg. Martin Luther King. I think that was Julie. And then we had, finally, Jesus gets a look in. How good is that, hey? After all that, Jesus gets a look in. I think that was, and Jacinta as well. I think you had Jesus. Look at that. That you can, Spiritual people, there they are, right there. You know, could you imagine, though, like, having that opportunity to be able to sit with the caliber of those people? You know, like, like it all sounds nice, but then when, if you really think about it, it's like, well, what questions would you ask? Like, what, what, what actually questions? Like, what, what would you think of to say to those people? You know, like, it, it would actually, I mean, it would be an interesting conversation, you know, like, Donald Trump, you know, how the nukes, you know, I don't know, like, like, where do you start? Like, you, like, if you actually thought about, like, the conversations you would have, the, the questions that you would ask, you know, you know, we, we see in the Bible that Jesus is asked many questions. In fact, the Bible records that Jesus is asked 183 questions. People wanted to know stuff about Jesus. People wanted to ask him stuff. Pe- people, people wanted to talk to him. People asked Jesus all sorts of questions. That they asked him, where's he from? That we can get rid of that, that slide now. They want to ask Jesus like, where he's from. They, 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 they wanted to ask Jesus what he was about. People asked Jesus questions like, where did he get all his wisdom and power to perform miracles? People asked uh, questions of Jesus. They said to him, they said, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Well, there's a strange question. People asked Jesus things like, what good thing do I have to do to inherit eternal life? People asked Jesus, they said, show us a, mirac- a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? People said, said things to Jesus, simple things like, Rabbi, how, how did you get here? Where did you come from? Where, where are you going? There's, people ask Jesus questions all the time. His disciples asked him things like, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? That they asked Jesus questions like, Tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? They said to Jesus things like, we have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? They they said to Jesus, they said, here's a young boy. He's got some bread. He's got some fish. But it's not enough for this crowd, with this huge crowd that's here. What, What good is it? They said to things, they asked Jesus questions like, Lord, are you going to wash my feet as well? They said to Jesus, Lord, who is it? They said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? In fact, the Bible only records two questions that people asked that Jesus never answered. You know, I'm sure for all of us, what an amazing opportunity to talk with Jesus. What questions would you ask? What question, if you could have a convert, if you could have dinner with Jesus... What questions would you ask? Would you be nervous? I I would be. I'd be worried I'm going to say something stupid. You know, like like there's Jesus all like glorious and shining and stuff like that. And you just kind of go, hey, Jesus, so um, do you like use sunscreen and stuff? Or are you just like, like, like I'd be worried I'm going to say something stupid or just say something dumb that doesn't sort of make sense, you know, like or just kind of. You know, hey, Jesus, um, how's the weather today? You know, like, oh, wow. You know, like, like what do you say to Jesus? Like, how do you, well, what are the questions that you would ask? Because really, when it comes down to it, what question can I really ask Jesus? What, what can I come up with that would cause Jesus to ponder or to think? Like, how smart do I think that I am that I could possibly have some kind of question to ask Jesus that would make him go, hmm, gee, I never thought of that one. That's an interesting point you make there, Jonathan. (laughs) What question could I, what, what could I possibly come up with? You know, the more I thought about this, the more I think that maybe we've got that whole idea wrong. 
Maybe we're actually thinking about it the wrong way. You know, you may have said this before. We say things like, well, when I get to heaven, I can't wait to ask Jesus that. I can't wait. I'm going to have some great questions for Jesus. I can't wait to find out that answer. Like Jesus needs to be interviewed. Like, like we're some kind of B grade psychologist saying, So, how did that make you feel, Jesus? You know, Jesus, I've got a question for you. Say, so, how did you feel about that? Like, what possible questions could we come up with? You know, I think the better thing for us, and certainly the harder thing for us, would be to say to Jesus, what would you like to ask me? What questions could you ask me? See, sometimes we want easy answers from Jesus, because let's face it, there's no hard questions for Jesus. Sometimes we want easy answers for him, rather than let him ask us the hard questions. We want to ask things like, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, why don't things ever work out? Jesus, why don't I have any money? Jesus, what are you doing about my marriage? Hey, Jesus, what are you doing about this same-sex issue that's going around the place? Jesus, what are you doing about all these things? You know, the truth is, all those questions are easy for Jesus. They're not hard questions for him. But we like asking those questions. Because when we're asking the questions, it makes it about changing the outside scenarios, changing the outside circumstances. But when we let Jesus ask us the questions, it's always about changing us. And we don't like that as much. Easy answers instead of hard questions allow us to try to change others instead of allowing Jesus to change us. So you know what, we need, we need to change the title of this message right now. I can't go with this anymore. It's not questions for Jesus. We're now going to go to questions from Jesus. We would be much better off if we allowed Jesus to ask us the questions instead of us asking him. Well, what sort of questions then did Jesus ask? What sort of questions do we see in Scripture that, that Jesus could ask of us today? Well, I've picked out three for us tonight from, uh, from the book of Luke in chapter 8. Three questions that we can ask ourselves. Those three questions are, where is your faith? What is your name? And who touched me? Now, why did I pick these three questions? There's lots of questions. Why did I pick these three? Well, first of all, it's all in the same chapter, so it made it easy for me. You know, just sort of chapter 8, just kind of flows like that. Works for me. But I also like these questions because they're personal and they're direct. They're, they're, there's no real wriggle room with it. You know, like, you know, sometimes Jesus is very good at asking questions. And I know if, sometimes you read the Bible, and I like to think I'm pretty good, but I read some of these questions, I'm like, Jesus, what are you even on about? I don't understand, you know. Like, I don't, why just, just, you know, sometimes he talks in like those third person sort of things, you know, like. But with these questions, they're direct. They're personal. Now, the first question was directed to his disciples. The second was spoken to someone who was bound to the state that they were in. And the third was inquisitive of someone who was hidden. We see these three questions. Where is your faith? What is your name? Who touched me? So the first one I'm going to read is from Luke 8 and starting in verse 22. Uh, The scripture should come up behind me there. And it says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Oh, that's that's not a bad idea right now, really, is it? Settled down for a nap. Sounds nice. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the winds and the raging waves. Suddenly, the storm stopped and all was calm. Then he, then, this is Jesus, then he asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Where is your faith? 
You know, I think for us who are believers here tonight, that question should leave us amazed, but also strike a bit of terror in us. Where is your faith? You know, we don't really like this question. What do you mean, Jesus, where's my faith? I got in the boat, didn't I? You asked me to go over, I did that. Like, why are you asking me, where's my faith? It was a bad storm. It makes sense for me to wake you up. You're there. You're the one who can do it. So why wouldn't I wake you up? You're here to help, right? I mean, this is what it's about. Why are you asking me where's my faith? I go to church, don't I? I even sometimes get there early. I only grabbed one donut today because I thought of everyone else. Right? We say these things, right? I'm a good person. Come on, Jesus, you know my heart. You, you, know, you know the real me. You know what's really going on. I'm here, aren't I? I made it. Why are you asking me, where's my faith? You know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So faith needs to be attached to something else. Dead faith is faith that isn't attached to anything. You can't just have faith on its by its own. It's faith that works is dead. We need to attach it to something else. You know, it's easy for us. It's easy for us to go through the motions of Christianity. To go through the motions of not having your faith attached to anything. Hey, I've got faith, but it's not, it's not attached to anything. It's not, it's not engaged in any way. It's in this light that no wonder Jesus would ask, where is your faith? What are you believing? And not even so much, what are you believing, but what are you believing and what are you doing? What, what attachment do you have to your faith? Are you just believing or are you doing like, where's, where's your faith? Where's your faith tonight? Now, many of us have an experience where maybe our faith was once attached to something, but maybe through circumstance or disappointment or through life's journey, our faith becomes detached. It's not active. It's not engaged anymore. It's in this environment that Jesus says, where's your faith? Now, it's important to note that I don't believe that when Jesus was saying this, that this was a, a condemnation or in this situation was a rebuke, but instead it's a call, it's a stirring. It's like, come on guys, where's your faith? Come on guys, I know the seas was there, I know it was bad, I know you're in trouble, I know, but where's your faith? It's a call, it's, it's a stirring. And it's a, it's a message that Jesus has for all of us tonight, especially for those of us who have been believers, especially for those of us who are walking with God. Where's your faith? It's, it's a calling. It's, it's a stirring that Jesus is doing. He's wanting to stir something in us tonight. Where's your faith tonight? What's your faith attached to? Is, is it just dead? Is it just flapping in the breeze, not doing anything? Or is your faith attached and believing for God to do something? What is your faith attached to? Can you articulate that tonight? Can, can you see here and say, well, my faith is attached to this. I'm believing for this, or I've got in my heart to see this thing. What is your faith attached to? Don't live the life God has, God has called you to live with dead faith. Attach it to something. Attach it and believe. We go on in the same passage. And we Kick off again in verse 27. Jesus says, what's your name? And this is the, the account that happens in that scenario. So verse 27 it says, as Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time, he had been homeless, naked, living in tombs outside the town. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. Verse 29 is interesting. It says, For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. 
This spirit had often taken control. Even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them, rushed into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. You jump ahead to verse 37, it says, And all the people in the region of, uh, I hate that word, begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Stop there. For a great wave of fear swept over them. So I was practicing that all afternoon too. Right. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him home. Don't you love Jesus? I, I read that this week. And I was just like, how good is Jesus? Jesus sends him home. Like, this man has had nothing. His whole life, everything's been stripped from him. Jesus comes and restores everything and demands nothing back and just sends him home. That is just such an amazing picture of the grace of Jesus, that he would just send him home. Let me come with you. Let me help you. Oh, my Jesus, I owe you everything. No, no, no. Just go home. Just go home. Just go home. That's just fantastic. He says, go home. He says, saying, now go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all through the town, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. What is your name? What is your name? Can you be honest before Jesus? Can you be real? You know, in the Old Testament, we read an account of Jacob wrestling with God. And there's a point in this struggle, as Jacob is wrestling, that God asks him, he says, what is your name? Now, this is a strange question because you think being God, he would know his name, right? So there's a reason for it. The name Jacob, in this context, means deceiver. And if you look at the life of Jacob, his whole life had been one deception after another. We see earlier in his life that he was in the same position trying to garner some blessing from his earthly father. And he's asked the same question. The earthly father says to him, what is your name? But instead of responding with Jacob, he responds with Esau. Because he's trying to deceive and use deception to get the blessing from his father. So we fast forward ahead and we see now Jacob in this same position being asked the same question from his heavenly father, except this time he answers honestly. And he says, my name is Jacob. And it's from that point that God blesses Jacob and gives him a new identity and calls him Israel, which means uh, may God prevail. You know, what does that tell us? What does that tell us with this man? This legion living in these tombs, it tells us that we need to be honest. We need to be honest before God. We need to be honest with Jesus when he asks us questions that that we don't just give him the sugar-coated version, but we're really honest with who we are and where we're at. Yeah, Jesus, I'm a good guy. I tried my best. You saw, you saw the lot that I started with. You saw the beginnings of, you know, things have been hard for me. You know, it's been tough. Hasn't always been easy. Do you trust Jesus enough to be honest with him? You know, when Jesus encounters this man living in these tombs, he is bound to his past. He is bound to those challenges. The Bible says that he is naked, homeless, and lives among the dead. And often our past makes us feel the same. We feel alone. We, 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 we feel exposed. And we feel a sense of finality. Like there's just no hope. Everywhere, everything I look at is just dead. There's, just no, there's, no, uh, there's no moving forward from this. This is just where I am. Yet Jesus asked for his name. And his response to this isn't, well, what does that matter? Why do you want to know my name, Jesus? Look at the state I'm in. Look at the troubles I've got. Look at the issues. Look at the struggles. Look at all the things that are going around me. Why are you asking me these questions? He's just open and honest. 
Jesus asks his name and he says, I'm legion. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't make it sound less than what it is. He doesn't overstate it either. But he's just honest. And you and I, we need to answer the hard questions from Jesus. And sometimes he asks us, he says, what's your name? Can you be honest with Jesus? Do you trust him enough? that you can show him who you really are, that you can tell him how you're really feeling, that that you can talk honestly and frankly to him? It's a tough question. And Jesus' response is, it's okay. Legion, that's okay. I can deal with that. That's okay. You're honest. That's okay. Hey, I understand. Hey, I see what you're living. Hey, I see what you're going through. It's okay. I'm here. I'm here. I don't demand anything from you. And he sets him free and sends him back to his family. What a picture of grace. No, tonight. This is for someone tonight. No, tonight. That your honesty leads to grace, not to condemnation. Your honesty leads you to a better place, not to a harder place. You're here tonight and you think, if I be honest before God, it will strip me of everything or opportunities or things for the future. Your honesty will actually be the thing that leads you to breakthrough because that's where His grace is. That's where His grace is. Be honest. Be honest. Goes home to his family. Jesus says, tell the people of everything that God has done. You know, his testimony now has great authority and keeps him safe from his past because he can be honest about who he is and where he came from. You know, maybe in church, if we were less interested in asking questions of others and let God ask a few questions of ourselves, Maybe we'd find it much easier to respond with grace and compassion and humility. Which if you weren't here this morning, I really encourage you to, the message that Pastor Mark shared this morning was just fantastic. About what we need to clothe ourselves in. How much more authority would our testimony have if we're honest about where we came from? We need to be honest. You know what, let's just get, let's get the band up. Let's get the band up. The third one we see, we continue on the, in the chapter, is Jesus asks, he says, who touched me? Luke 8, 42 says, as Jesus went with him, he's with Jairus, as he went with him, he was surrounded by crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe, immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. Peter said, Master, the the whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him. And that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Who touched me? When did we ever decide to stop reaching out to Jesus? When did we ever decide that it's a good idea to stay hidden and to stop reaching out to Him? When did we ever become a case of, well, I've had my feel and that's enough? Why would we not reach out to Jesus when we can? The Bible says that this woman was hidden amongst the crowd and she pushed through to touch Jesus. 
And Jesus recognises what's happened. Jesus recognises that there's something more is just exchanged than just a touch, that, that there's been a healing power, that something of significance has occurred. And Jesus is unable to move forward until this mystery is solved. The Bible says that she was hidden in the crowd, but then she revealed herself. And then Jesus proclaims her healing in front of the whole crowd. How liberating would that be? If you've been bound up in that issue for all those years, everyone knows you as you're that woman. Now all of a sudden, Jesus proclaims in front of everyone the healing that you have received. Her hidden private push became her public praise. What she achieved in secret, Jesus used as a public display of His grace and power. When did we ever decide as a church, as Christians, as individuals, that we would stop reaching out to God? When did we ever decide that that was a good idea? To stop privately pushing through? Is it because we've reached a level in our Christian walk and it's like, well, this is it, I've made it now, this is kind of good, I'm in a good spot, so I don't need to push through anymore? When do we ever come to that place in our relationship with Him that we stop the private push through and we settle with our issues and our challenges? Because I've had my enough. I've had had my little bit. Jesus, you did so, you've done some things for me and and that's all good, Jesus. And now I've just, I've just settled with what I've got now. When did we ever choose that that was a good idea? Why would we not reach out to Jesus when He is so available and there for us? Why would we not reach out to Him? You know, it'd be easy to talk about times of private prayer and pushing through and absolutely that's all part of it. But who knows that you can be in a crowd, but you can feel absolutely alone. I think so many times we can come to church, stand in service, enjoy the music, enjoy the time with friends and catching up. But for some reason, we've stopped the private push through. We've stopped that private desperation and hunger for God. We've settled with the experiences that we've just we've just stopped. Jesus asks, "Who touched me?" I ask you tonight: When was the last time you touched Jesus? When was the last time you pushed through privately, hidden in your own heart? in worship, in, a, in a, even an atmosphere like tonight, standing here or whatever it is tonight. But in your own heart, making a decision to say, I'm going to push through. I'm going to push through to touch Jesus. I want to ask you all to stand right now. Where's your faith? What's your name? Who touched me? Christ, you're all right now. Why were you standing? Just to lift your hands if you can. Where's your faith tonight? Let Jesus right now ask you that question. Where's your faith tonight? What is your faith attached to? What are you believing for? Can you articulate it tonight? Do you know what you're believing for?
let Jesus ask you tonight, what's your name? Can you be honest before Him tonight? Can you be honest with who you are and where you're at? Can you be honest with the real state you're in? Tell Him who you are. What's your name? And tonight, let Jesus ask you, who touched me? Are you prepared to touch Him tonight? Are you prepared to push through? prepared to receive from Him tonight? Are you prepared to ignore the crowd? Ignore the things of life that would distract and surround and seemingly make it hard to push through? Will you value touching Jesus more than those things? Will you value pushing through and and touching that guy, even just a little edge, that's all you need? Will you value that more than the distractions, more than the crowd, more than the things that seemingly get in the way? I just want to pray for you tonight, right where you're standing. Father, just pray for people standing here. Holy Spirit, I know you're working on people's hearts even right now. You're asking those questions. Where's your faith? What's your name? Who touched me? And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in the hearts of people tonight, that you would do a deep work, that tonight wouldn't just be a just a single moment. But I pray that these questions, Lord God, would resonate in people's hearts and minds all this week. Lord, that you would help us tonight to to do a personal stock take, to stop asking questions on the outside and to start allowing Jesus to ask us some questions. That we would drop our defense Drop our need to know everything and be an open book and say, Jesus, ask me something that we'd be prepared to let Jesus speak and that we would listen and respond. We would respond honestly. We would be real and authentic. We would respond with faith. We would respond with with a sense of not dread or death, but moving forward in life. That we would push through privately because there's a miracle that you have for us on the other side. I thank you, Jesus, for these people gathered here tonight. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord in every ear, in every way. Amen. I just, I just ask you to stay standing. I'm going to come to a close in a minute. But there's two times Jesus didn't answer questions. Would you like to know what they are? Would you like to know what they are? Right in Mark 14 and 15, Mark 14 says, Then the high priest stood before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Again, later in Mark 15, we see that the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they're bringing up against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. You know, both these occasions that I just read of, are right before Jesus is crucified. 
right before the moment He goes to the cross to give His life for you and for me. It was on this occasion when Jesus was asked these questions that He sort of thought it better not to answer, but to give a demonstration. He gave a demonstration. He demonstrated to the people who were accusing Him, pointing the finger, the people who were, who were trying to uh, kill Him, and He demonstrated to them. Rather than answer the questions, He demonstrated His love when He died on the cross. He demonstrated His love to all of us in every single way. He put on display the full love that He has for you and me. On this occasion, He let His actions do the talking. Or maybe tonight you're here and you need a Savior. Can I tell you tonight, Jesus does, just doesn't have an answer for you. He is the answer. He is the demonstration of the answer. He is the demonstration of love. He is the demonstration that He wants to, he, and he wants to show you tonight. He wants to give it to you tonight. And so that's you if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, you never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I want to invite you to raise your hand right now because I believe Jesus wants to demonstrate His love to you the best way that He can and that is show you and that is give you eternal life, give you an eternity with Him, be in relationship with Him. That is the best thing you could ever do. That is the best thing that will ever happen is to know Jesus for yourself. Anyone here tonight says, I look across this crowd. Jesus wants to demonstrate to you tonight who He is. Just going to wait one more moment just to look around. Maybe you, maybe you felt a separation from Him and you want to reconnect tonight. You want to reattach your life again to Him. I ask you, please be bold. Raise your hand. Love to pray for you tonight. You know what all? Fantastic. Fantastic. Come on, just lift your hands one last time. I'm just going to pray. Then the band are going to lead us. We're going to come to a close. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, help us to stop asking and to start listening. Help us, Jesus, to listen to what you're asking us and to answer with honesty and authenticity. We thank you, Jesus for who you are. We thank you for your demonstration of love. We thank you, Jesus, that you came for us, that you made it, you made it possible for us to know you. And we give you all honor and glory in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, Ben, why don't you just lead us? Let's just sing that... Uh, Whatever the song was I said before. Beautiful name. So I said, we're just gonna sing, let's just sing this chorus. And then, uh, then we're gonna come to a close. Thank you for coming tonight. Love to invite you out to the cafe. And uh, we're just, but we're gonna sing this together. Hey, let's just lift up Jesus one last time. Can we do that? Can we touch him together? Come on. Let's press it. Thanks. Thanks, guys.